Right, the title of the talk is Seeing Through the Eyes of Horus, and I imagine that most of you will know that Horus is the sun god of ancient Egypt, an aspect of the god Ra, and particularly the, the, the god of the horizon, the morning sun. And what I'm going to talk about is how the kingship and, and rituals and theology of um, Egypt were based very much on the environment in which the civilization grew and developed. Uh, I think it's very important to try and understand the ancient mind and how you do that is you look at the environmental landscape in which that civilization was born. And in the case of Egypt, it's a, it's a remarkable landscape, very different to anything else on the planet. So I'm going to show you some of the ideas that evolve out of Egyptology. It's not the sort of thing you're going to see in an ordinary book on the subject. Uh, most Egyptologists don't talk about this material. We only talk about this material in pubs over pints usually, and nobody actually writes about it. So we're going to explore a number of things, um, and hopefully we'll get a better understanding of how the Egyptian mind worked, especially the elites of society, not the ordinary common folk, but the elites that ruled the country, the kings and their courtiers and nobility. Those are the people we're dealing with in this talk. So, oops, wrong way. There we go. So, concepts and realities. This is just going to si sort of simplify what we're going to talk about. The geography or the physical world of Egypt is important to understand, and you all, I'm sure, know a lot about that. But we're going to deal with the periphery elements within the country as well. And modern Egypt isn't ancient Egypt. It's a very different uh, system. Um, the Egyptians understood Egypt to be the Nile Valley. The deserts weren't part of Egypt at all, as in modern Egypt. Now, there was Sinai. That wasn't a part of Egypt either. And it's that contrast between the Nile Valley and the deserts which helped the way the Egyptians evolved their thinking about their world. And, of course, the environment itself is the world in which you, they live. So not just the geography of it, but the actual things that happen in that world, the things that happen on, a, on an annual basis, the things that attracted them about uh, the way they govern the land and where they control their calendars, and their, their farming practices. And the other thing, of course, is how that evolved into theology. So that's the metaphysical side of things, and how they translated what they experienced in their own lives into the theological aspects of the culture. Now, there are some preliminary notes for those people who are taking notes. The first thing is you're going to learn a few Egyptian words today. Okay, and interestingly, a lot of them have come through into the English language which you're probably not aware of. And then we're going to try and understand this little question. Understanding existence in terms of the Egyptian mind and how they conceived e existence. And then for Andy, where's Andy? Down there. Stand up, Andy. Andy's going to talk to you about the cult of the bee. Is that tomorrow or the day after? Sunday. On Sunday. So I've got three little bees here for him. I thought I'd pop them in here. Oh, thank you. But these bees are not these little creatures. These are the bees of the English language, the letter B. But before we get into this in detail, because of the type of conference this is, I just want to highlight something about the origins of Egyptian civilization um, and deal with these people called the Sheb to you, because what you're going to hear about over the next two days is a lot about Hermetica and the ideas of the bringing of wisdom to Egypt. And that particular strand of Egyptian culture derives from the Edfu temple and these people called the Sheptiu, who you've probably never heard of, and not many people have. They are a series of gods. And the, the inscriptions, if you ever go to Edfu, are located in two locations. They're here on the uh, west, side, west side of the Proneos and also down here on the interior of the first pylon. Uh, th this one is very difficult to see if you go there because it's covered in soot and, and mess and droppings and things. This one is almost impossible to see because it's so high up on the Proneos. But I'm going to take you there by means of a uh, TV crew that was filming out there, a series called Egyptian Genesis, and uh, we were able to get quite close to it. So they are located inside the South Pylon, and they're also located outside the West Proneos up here, high up on the wall. If you are standing on the bottom of the Proneus, you can't actually see it. It's so high up. It's this row of gods along here. Nobody could see it. 
It's up there, not for people to see. It's up there because of theology. It's up there so that on the memory of this event, whatever happened in prehistory, is recorded there for all time. And we'll get back to this idea of recording things for all time a bit later on. So here's our film crew on the top of the exterior wall of the temple, and this is the Proneos, and these are our Sheptiu gods sitting on thrones on the primeval mound. This was back in 2001 when we did this. And you see the king here is worshipping the Horus Falcon standing on the Jeba, or the reeds, on the primeval mound of existence where civilization was created in the Egyptian mind. And these eight gods here... I've got some very interesting names. Two amongst them are leaders of them, namely Wa and A, the lords of the island of aggression, which is a very interesting term, which never appears anywhere else in Egyptian text. They are the two gods who founded this place and who were the first to exist there in the company of Ra. So they've got a memory of some distant event that took place before these, these gods arrived in Egypt. And here we see uh, the Horus Falcon on the, what we call the Jabbar. Okay, that's another term that's, again, very rare in the literature. So what we're understanding is that that word means a, a stand of reeds surrounding the primeval mound of creation. And here we too see the first two leaders of this group of eight gods. And Wa, there, is the great one. And, sorry, the distant one, and A'a, it's the great one. These are term, Egyptian terms for these two gods. You don't find these gods in any literature. You don't know them by these names. And the third one, very interestingly, is called Nai. And Nai means sailor. So there's a nautical element to this. There's a, a navigational aspect to it. The rest of the eight are very strange. Jezatep is the sacred head. Then you have somebody called Serpent of the Earth. And then the Lord of Twin Hearts. And, and then Lord of Life and Power. And then the strangest one of all is the Mighty Chested Lord who made slaughter. Uh, the ghost who lives on blood. He's the eighth of the, God, of, the, of the eight gods. And they have remarkable epithets as well. They're called the August Sheptiu. And the word Sheptiu in Egyptian means senior ones. They're called the t children of Chenen, and Chenen is the risen land out of the flood or the abyss. Out of the waters of chaos, an island rose, and that is called Chenen in Egyptian. They are the offspring of the creator god, Artum. So they are directly one, one level down from the creator, these gods. They're called the glorious spirits of the early primeval age. So we're talking about Septepi here, if you know your Egyptian terminologies. The Brethren of the Sages. So the Apkalu of Mesopotamian legend are here in the Egyptian text as well. They're seven in number, and yet there are eight gods here. So that's a conundrum until you find out who the first one is. They're called the Builder Gods because they built the first temple on the planet where God was worshipped for the first time. And they're also called, and this is the important one, Thoth and the Seven Sages. So the eighth, the, pri the first one, the primary one, is in fact Thoth. And the rest, the other seven, are the Seven Sages. So that begins to give you an idea, I think, of we're talking about how Hermetica evolves out of Egyptian mythology and legend. So let's start now with this idea of existence, the meaning of life, to coin a Monty Python phrase. There are seven aspects to Egyptian existence. Let's go through those. The body, which is the vessel of your car, or your spirit, or your soul, it is nothing more than that. It actually is shown in Egyptian hieroglyphs as a pot in which your essence is contained. And when you die, that pot is empty.